Section 15. Dialectic Interdependentness of Ends and Means A means can be justified only by its end, but the end in turn needs to be justified. From the Marxist point of view, which expresses the historical interests of the proletariat, the end is justified if it leads to increasing the power of man over nature and to the abolition of the power of man over man. We are to understand that in achieving this end, anything is permissible? Sarcastically demands the Philistine, demonstrating that he understood nothing. That is permissible, we answer, which really leads to the liberation of mankind. Since this end can be achieved only through revolution, the liberating morality of the proletariat of necessity is endowed with a revolutionary character. It irreconcilably counteracts not only religious dogma, but every kind of idealistic fetish, these philosophic gendarmes of the ruling class. It deduces a rule for conduct from the laws of the development of society, thus primarily from the class struggle, this law of all laws. Just the same, the moralist continues to insist. Does it mean in the class struggle against the capitalists all means are permissible? Lying, frame-up, betrayal, murder, and so on? Permissible and obligatory are those and only those means, we answer, which unite the revolutionary proletariat, fill their hearts with irreconcilable hostility to oppression, teach them contempt for official morality and its democratic echoers, imbue them with consciousness of their own historic mission, raise their courage and spirit of self-sacrifice in the struggle. Precisely from this, it flows that not all means are permissible. When we say that the end justifies the means, then for us the conclusion follows that the great revolutionary end spurns those base means and ways which set one part of the working class against other parts, or attempt to make the masses happy without their participation, or lower the faith of the masses in themselves and their organization, replacing it by worship for the leaders. Primarily and irreconcilably, revolutionary morality rejects servility in relation to the bourgeoisie and haughtiness in relation to the toilers. That is, those characteristics in which petty bourgeois pedants and moralists are thoroughly steeped. These criteria do not, of course, give a ready answer to the question as to what is permissible and what is not permissible in each separate case. There can be no such automatic answers. Problems of revolutionary morality are fused with the problems of revolutionary strategy and tactics. The living experience of the movement under the clarification of theory provides the correct answer to these problems. Dialectic materialism does not know dualism between means and end. The end flows naturally from the historical movement. Organically, the means are subordinated to the end. The immediate end becomes the means for a further end. In his play Franz von Sickingen, Ferdinand LaSalle puts the following words into the mouth of one of the heroes. Show not the goal, but show also the path. So closely interwoven are path and goal that each with other ever changes, and other paths forwith another goal set up. LaSalle's lines are not at all perfect. Still worse is the fact that in practical politics, LaSalle himself diverged from the above expressed precept, it is sufficient to recall that he went as far as secret agreements with Bismarck. But the dialectic interdependence between means and end is expressed entirely correctly in the above quoted sentences. Seeds of wheat must be sown in order to yield an ear of wheat. 
is individual terror, for example, permissible or impermissible from the point of view of pure morals? In this abstract form, the question does not exist at all for us. Conservative Swiss bourgeois even now render official praise to the terrorist William Tell. Our sympathies are fully on the side of the Irish, Russian, Polish, or Hindu terrorists in their struggle against national and political oppression. The assassinated Kirov, a rude satrap, does not call forth any sympathy. Our relation to the assassin remains neutral only because we know not what motives guided him. If it became known that Nikolaev acted as a conscious avenger for workers' rights trampled upon by Kirov, our sympathies would be fully on the side of the assassin. However, not the question of subjective motives, but that of objective expediency has for us the decisive significance. Are the given means really capable of leading to the goal? In relation to individual terror, both theory and experience bear witness that such is not the case. To the terrorists, we say, it is impossible to replace the masses. Only in the mass movement can you find expedient expression for your heroism. However, under conditions of civil war, the assassination of individual oppressors ceases to be an act of individual terror. If, we shall say, a revolutionist bombed General Franco and his staff into the air, it would hardly evoke moral indignation, even from the democratic eunuchs. Under the conditions of civil war, a similar act would be politically completely expedient. Thus, even the sharpest question, murder of man by man, moral absolutes prove futile. Moral evaluations, together with those political, flow from the inner needs of struggle. The liberation of the workers can come only through the workers themselves. There is, therefore, no greater crime than deceiving the masses, palming off defeats as victories, friends as enemies, bribing workers' leaders, fabricating legends, staging false trials, in a word, doing what the Stalinists do. These means can serve only one end, lengthening the domination of a clique already condemned by history. But they cannot serve to liberate the masses. That is why the Fourth International leads against Stalinism a life-and-death struggle. The masses, of course, are not at all impeccable. Idealization of the masses is foreign to us. We have seen them under different conditions, at different stages, and in addition, in the biggest political shocks. We have observed their strong and weak sides. Their strong side, resoluteness, self-sacrifice, heroism, has always found its clearest expression in times of revolutionary upsurge. During this period, the Bolsheviks headed the masses. Afterward, a different historical chapter loomed when the weak side of the oppressed came to the forefront. Heterogeneity, insufficiency of culture, narrowness of world outlook. The masses, tired of the tension, became disillusioned, lost faith in themselves, and cleared the road for the new aristocracy. In this epic, the Bolsheviks, Trotskyists, found themselves isolated from the masses. Practically, we went through two such big historic cycles, 1897 to 1905, the years of flood tide, 1907 to 1913, years of ebb, 1917 to 1923, a period of upsurge, unprecedented in history. Finally, a new period of reaction, which has not ended even today. In these immense events, the Trotskyists learn the rhythm of history, that is, the dialectics of the class struggle. They also learned, it seems, and to a certain degree successfully, how to subordinate their subjective plans and programs to this objective rhythm. 
they learned not to fall into despair over the fact that the laws of history do not depend on their individual tastes and are not subordinated to their own moral criteria. They learned to subordinate their individual desires to the laws of history. They learned not to become frightened by the most powerful enemies if their power is in contradiction to the needs of historical development. They know how to swim against the stream in the deep conviction that the new historic flood will carry them to the other shore. Not all will reach that shore. Many will drown. But to participate in this movement with open eyes and with an intense will, only this can give the highest moral satisfaction to a thinking being. Postscript I wrote these lines during those days when my son struggled unknown to me with death. I dedicate to his memory this small work, which I hope would have met with his approval. Leon Sadov was a genuine revolutionist and despised the Pharisees. <laughs>